All right. Welcome back, everybody. I hope you had a great afternoon uh, with the breakout sessions. Uh, I know the Birds of a Feather lunch, uh, lunches were uh, uh, well attended and lively, so that's uh, fantastic. Uh, we've got a, got a great panel uh, in store for you to kind of close out the day, and they're going to be discussing uh, microservices as a requirement for agile software to find businesses. And uh, it's really just a, uh, uh, just a rocking panel in terms of uh, the people on it. So without further ado, let me uh, call up the panel. We'll bring one up, and it's going to be uh, chaired by Jonah Cow. And uh, so, Jonah, won't you and the team come on up? Thanks a lot for joining us today. Uh, we're going to have a nice little discussion here. We've got a mix of uh, vendors and end users. My name's Jonah Cowell. I'm a VP here at AppDynamics, and uh, I'll be moderating the panel. I'm going to have each of the panelists introduce themselves, but... Uh, this is a very interesting trend. Everyone is interested in microservices and containers, but we don't often understand the reality of what it takes to actually make these types of changes in our organizations, our people, our process, our technology. Uh, so we're going to discuss some of the uh, challenges here. Uh, you'll get some uh, great input as to uh, what an end user does and what the vendor community sees too. So. Uh, my name is Chris Morgan. I'm our technical director for the OpenShift partner ecosystem at Red Hat. Hi, I'm Doug Sherman. I'm a tech lead and architect at uh, DreamWorks Animation. Hi, I'm Alan Name. I'm a product manager at Google, focused on uh, our Google Cloud platform. My areas of coverage are Kubernetes and containers. Hi, my name is Parash Hall. I'm a program manager on the Azure Compute team. I work on Azure Service Fabric, which is our microservices platform, and I focus on container integration. Great. Thanks a lot, everyone, for joining us. I wanted to start out with a really basic thing. What's your definition of a microservice? A couple sentences, how you would define it, and some key points that you would make in that definition. OK, I guess I'm the customer here. So, <laughs> so microservices, we were just talking about this back there, uh, about how how you can interpret it a hundred different ways. And so I can give you my, my perspective of what it is. Um, so it's, it's basically a web service. For those familiar with the web service, it's, it's a way to offer functionality in a sort of language neutral, platform neutral way. Um, and then the micro part of it is that you want to concentrate that service down into some core functionality. So if you think about Linux, Linux is an operating system composed of all little parts that all themselves have little componentry and functionality, and, and combined is what creates that. So all in all, it's, it's, it's you're allowing little independent bits of functionality to, to exist independent of one another. And that, that's our ultimate understanding of what that is. So um, my definition of a microservice is really it's a self-contained unit of deployment that performs a single function. And it performs that function really, really well. And it enables you to build applications that are polyglot in nature, heterogeneous. So as you look at taking an application that today would be monolithic in nature and decomposing it into various bits, and your team spans areas around the world, you have teams that have different specialties around language runtimes, well, now you have the ability to really roll out services in, in, in a fashion where you can have teams with different expertise build applications and roll out updates in a continuous fashion. Um, so really containers, um, which we'll talk about later, are an enabling fabric to microservices. Yeah, to add on what Alan said, um, to me microservices is basically, it's an autonomous service that is usually centered around a business functionality. So in a monolith application, basically your application uh, consisted of a lot of requirements from your company, from different departments. Microservice is really focused around a business uh, functionality or business scenario. And by focusing on only that, you can have smaller teams the service is uh, updatable and deployable and upgradable um, independently, which is a huge uh, advantage. And with that, like nowadays, what you really want to do is you want to be um, quick to market, right? You get new market requirements, whether it's from your internal customers, external customers, um, and you want to react quickly. And that's why it's great to have like this autonomous unit that you can deploy independently without like big 
uh, integration testing with other like monolith or with other services that make up a monolith. Great. Did you want to say anything, Chris? <laughs> I think they said plenty. All right. So the other interesting synonym with microservices that we've all gone through is SOA. So how can you describe why microservices are different? Because many of us and many of you in the audience were probably burned by the promise of these big SOA systems and, and potentially bought them and tried to adapt your software to them. So for me, um, <clears throat> SOA is really about connecting different business systems where when I think of microservices, I think of a single application with multiple subsystems. Um, they're similar in nature, but they're kind of solving different problems, I would argue. You can have a service-oriented architecture made up of a micro, set of microservice uh, applications. Um, I mean, that's fundamentally the difference, what I see. Yeah, no, I'd, I'd agree with you. We, we started off at DreamWorks about, I'd say, six, seven years ago with the SOA mantra. Our CEO is all about SOA. And so we had a vendor come in, and I'll, I won't name the vendor, but uh, they make lots of money and have a giant boat in the bay. Uh, they, uh, they were very keen on selling us a whole suite of product, and it was all about this collective of, of stuff to organize us, and it was supposed to simplify down everything that we did, but in, in reality, I found it to be a lot more complicated. Everything was very contract-based. I mean, everything was good meaning, but I found it to be sort of overloaded. By the time I had built all the componentry, the added latency and all the complexity and then the education, it, it actually was counterproductive, I found, in the beginning. I think microservice aims to make things simpler in the same way that people view JSON as a simpler approach than XML, in the same way that people view REST as a simpler approach than SOAP. It's this sort of moving towards simpler to build, simpler to deploy, easier to understand. Uh, SOA seemed like it came with a, a higher level of, of understanding sophistication that you needed to have. I'll add one last thing, though, where I will give it some props. I think for legacy houses, and this is what they, they told us a lot about, where they had success, where you have old, older processes, let's say it's things that communicate by dropping things in a file system. doesn't know how to speak over HTTP. You know, it's, a, it's an older system. It did have good approaches to try to unify all these different disparate systems in the way that they communicated with an ESB and, and allow them all to sort of interoperate. And that, I did think there was a lot of value in that. But from DreamWorks, we were starting fresh. We had nothing. So there wasn't as much value in having a bunch of disparately talking things. We were able to sort of ground up everything to, to kind of be able to speak the same. So a lot of that added tooling, added complexity more than it really simplified or enabled us. But that, that's kind of our story. Just to add to that, SOA was traditionally um, very much an enterprise term. To, to really be successful with SOA, you needed a registry, service registry, you needed a service repository, you needed a service bus. And a lot of these components were closed in nature, right? There were black boxes, and you had to invest quite a bit of money to buy these packages and stitch them all together and train up people to really understand how to use all these things. Microservices is, when I look at the current world in terms of the types of problems that microservices are solving, they're very similar in nature to what SOA was trying to solve 10 years ago, but the technologies underneath microservices is very open in nature. If you look at the various components, a lot of it is open source. So the building blocks are um, very much easier in some ways to stitch together, and the ROI is not as, you know, it's not like you have to climb Mount Everest to really achieve that ROI uh, that you had, you know, with SOA. Oh boy, it's really hard to do the fifth in a row. So, but basically, uh, I agree with everything that was said. Maybe one thing that I would want to add is, if you think about the definition of a microservice again, and um, like what SOA was meant to be, SOA, if you use the SOA patterns, it's both are focused around services, but SOA was meant to be to make things generically available, like in your organization, while a microservice again is just like centered. So it's a it's a more granular thing. That's that's how I look at it. In addition to everything. Uh, so I actually have a question for Doug being the end user. Um, why did you guys, or why do you see people moving towards microservices? So 
so DreamWorks, let's see <laughs> how politically correct it be. There's it, a lot of cowboys, and Kyle out there knows. <laughs> We've got a lot of eager developers, a lot of really smart people, and they all want to sort of independently be able to function and provide value and do, do kind of their own thing. The thing is that we've got a lot of different people who are experts in different language spaces. They're familiar with different frameworks. We had a lot of people that were interested in different backend databases. And given the legacy of the studio, um, when we were smaller, when we used to do like say one movie every two or three years as opposed to, I don't know, I think there's anywhere from nine productions in any given year that are running concurrently. It's a lot bigger now. In those older days, we were able to get away with like kind of one big monolithic app and the teams were smaller, and so the teams that, that worked together could contribute without stomping on each other. But as we grew and as the productions grew, we found that all the joins in the databases and being able to actually move anything while productions were, were going on was, was really difficult. And we found the database queries slowing up because people were introducing all this complexity. With the microservices approach, we were finally able to kind of carve people off into their comfort zones, allow them to be creative and, and, and good at what they do in their own kind of space. And if people wanted to kind of go their own way with Mongo or Cassandra, they could do it. And if it didn't work out, they could replace the back end with something else because as long as the contract was met, as long as the thing that they were using was, was unchanging, the APIs that people interfaced with, they, they could independently revision up as much as they want. The other value too is scaling for us was really hard. So we had these really big legacy apps if they started getting crushed, you know, it wasn't as easy as staying up two or three more of them. They didn't know how to talk together. You know, it was never intended to be anything more than the one big app. So with microservices and, and sort of empowered through containers and, and these, these new technologies that help sort of stand these things up on demand, you're able to, without eating a lot of ex, extra compute that you don't need, you're able to specialize in, in growing a certain section of the application when that application became stressed. So let's say as an example, we have something that answers a very difficult query. For that particular thing, we can spin off two, three, four more instances of that. With the containerization of this stuff, we can spin up five, six more instances of that backend database just for that little bit of functionality without having to blow up times 10 the entirety of the app. And there's a lot of power in that. And we're able to do that and, 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 and design that thing using whatever language is appropriate to design that thing in. So there's, again, there's a lot of power in that as well. So for us, moving to microservices is a huge, a huge boost in our productivity and just it liberates people. And again, with the, the sort of containers, which a lot of these guys represent, there's all kinds of new capabilities that we had that we didn't have before. Another, one other quick thing I'll add is we were talking back there, um, getting access to a database used to be really difficult. So if I wanted to get some new tables, space in, say my, my backend database, a relational database like Oracle or Postgres, it would require a DBA to spend a, a good deal of time to carve that out, partition it out, and, and now this sort of self-serve on-demand database thing is, is a reality. I can actually be empowered now to instance my own Cassandra and, and have at it, and, and that just didn't exist for us before. And so as a developer, that's, that's amazing. I'm not sitting on my hands for two weeks waiting for my tables to exist. If I want a development environment and a test environment, I can spin those up, you know, within within minutes. So it's it's a game changer for us. I think on that. So so it's pretty interesting just to hear you talk about it because a lot of that is about the true culture of the organization, empowering your people in order to keep them happy so that they continue to work and be productive employees in your company. Yeah. It's not so much about the technology, but about how it empowers people to make changes and make a difference in their day-to-day -day work. Yeah. So, yeah, that's interesting. I think one thing I'll add, though, on the, on the, on the caution side, okay. great. <laughs> is, you know, it's that whole with great power comes great responsibility, and that couldn't be more true. I think, um, as I've said, microservices, they're deceptively simple. If you go on any website in your language, uh, you're going to find probably that Hello World app that looks incredibly easy. Spring Boot for Java makes it super simple. If you're in Python, there's I've seen like five lines of code that can produce a, a, a pretty pretty interesting app. But but all in all, I think with the danger you know we're dealing with it right now is that when people feel like oh I'm a microservices engineer I let me at it and they and they they jump their app in the environment and then suddenly there's there's 20 apps and there's 30 apps and all kinds of orchestration starts happening and then suddenly you know Shrek 10 doesn't get done. And uh, someone's in trouble. <laughs>
So it's, it's, I think there needs to be a little bit of discipline and governance. There's a whole lot that's skipped over about how complicated it can be to organize all of that and to not, not let it kind of get out of control just because you can make a web service doesn't mean that, that you should. <laughs> so I'll leave it at that. So the other thing that came up a couple times uh, in the discussion was around Docker and containers and orchestrating and scaling and managing all of these different services that are moving around is a big challenge. So I, I pose to you, uh, what are the challenges around orchestration and do you believe that we have the right solutions in the open source community that you guys are leveraging? So to, to answer that question, I think we need to take a look at the world from today's lens and the future lens. Um, using today's lens, you know, Docker and containers and, and, and so on have really um, solved some of the problems around deployment, you know, by being able to deploy app services in a hermetically sealed fashion that are self-contained in nature and, and, and do it in a repeatable, predictable fashion. You're solving a lot of the DevOps problems that exist today in terms of rolling out features and functionality. But um, there are a number of other challenges that exist in terms of being able to deploy applications in a distributed fashion, right? So we touch on distributed computing. And this is where you need to think of a workload from a cluster perspective versus a single machine perspective, really to take advantage of resources very efficiently. Because the last thing you want to do is deploy a micro microservice per VM or microservice per machine. You'll end up with lots of compute that's used inefficiently. So to really leverage compute and cloud infrastructure in an efficient manner, you need to look at uh, various distributed computing paradigms. And this leads you down the path of really uh, container clusters, container scheduling, container orchestrations. And um, you know, at Google, we, we developed everything at, from search to apps on top of containers. Even our cloud runs on top of containers. And really to get the benefits and be able to deliver our services quickly, over the last 10 years, we developed a cluster manager called Borg. And this has really allowed our developers to build uh, functionalities in, in such a way that enables us to roll out features very quickly. Um, and to help, you know, during this transition phase, as customers are looking at really taking advantage of container computing and, and cluster management, we open sourced our um, some of the best practices around Borg, um, something called Kubernetes. Uh, we open sourced it, and this is one way of really managing workloads and really starting to think of applications in terms of, you know, what is my desired state? How do I want my application to um, act? And Kubernetes under the hood has a control mechanism that ensures your application has all your microservices are running. There's X amount of replicas that are running. It's deployed across uh, various availability zones, um, and so on and so on. So it's 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 not simple, but at the same time, it allows you to really achieve the benefits that containers provide. Uh, Chris, do you want to chime in because uh, I wanted to hear a little bit about your perspective on that? So um, with OpenShift, we actually utilize Kubernetes and uh, the Docker container format under the hood. Uh, what, what I find interesting, because of the way the question was worded, did containers cause microservices or did microservices cause containers? Because you know, we've been using containers for years. Even Google, you mentioned the Borg. They've been using containers probably for a decade right before Kubernetes came out. Um, and, and so, I, I, you know, it's kind of a chicken and egg thing when you look at that. But, you know, when, when I look at the orchestration of the containers and an app, I mean, there were a lot of pieces there in Kubernetes to allow you to run the microservices. But what's really interesting, it didn't have the concept of an application. And, and so we spent a lot of effort creating things where you could understand and link all these services together and represent them uh, better as an application and drive the app lifecycle through it. And, 
honestly, that's been a lot of the work we've been doing with you guys, is to you know, be able to automatically monitor that from an application perspective as it's deployed into the cluster. But uh, you know, the, the exciting thing for me, given at, at Red Hat, we believe a little bit in open source, is, is to see that a lot of this stuff is, is, is built on open source technologies. And, and we're even friends with Microsoft now, right? You know, so uh, they're getting on the bandwagon. That's, and that's we embrace stuff. open source. <laughs> so, I mean, yeah, that's, that's kind of where we're pushing it, I believe. All right. And uh, Boris, can you uh, chime in a little bit on Microsoft's strategy or your take on containers and yeah. where you guys are going with uh, orchestration as well? Yeah, so um, I think Alan has described very well the challenges that come with distributed systems. Uh, in Microsoft, um, we are we're having two approaches right now. The first one is, um, obviously, My Microsoft Azure is a very open platform, so you can literally run anything you want on Azure not even Red Hat. You can run Kubernetes on Azure, you can, you can run Mesos on Azure, and then any framework on Mesos, like for example, Marathon, Kronos, um, or Swarm, um, those type of schedulers, right? And that help you get your, that helps with your getting your cluster managed, right? Getting your containers distributed and so on and so forth. Um, but again, this is not um, at an application level at that point because you're literally just deploying a bunch of like individual uh, containers, but then you also need to think about like things, how do, for example, services on one host find the service or the endpoint on another host, right? So those are problems that, that you basically introduce. Um, and there, there are great open source solutions for that. Um, and again, so we have in Microsoft, we, you can run any open source framework, like as I mentioned on it. But we also have a thing that's called Azure uh, Service Fabric. Azure Service Fabric has been used internally for about I, I want to say six years. So our large services run on Azure Service Fabric. So for example, SQL Azure um, runs on Azure Service Fabric or Cortana or Bing. They run on Azure Service Fabric. And similar to what Google did with Kubernetes, we said, hey, that's, that's, that's a really great framework because it solves exactly those problems of distributed computing. So we want to bring it forward and basically give it to our customers. And that's what we've done in November. Um, I want to add that Service Fabric actually adds one layer on top of it because we not only have like cluster management and orchestration capabilities, but it also comes with like programming frameworks like reliable collection and actors. Um, I think what's really new about Service Fabric uh, with regards to microservices is that we introduce stateful service, which means a true stateful service. So for example, your service stores the state literally next to compute in every hyperscale scenario. You want to do that in order to avoid like net network hops, latencies, and so on and so forth. Um, so Service Fabric right now, um, Coming back to your question, is available on Windows, but we're going to move it onto Linux as well. Um, we're going to support not only .NET, we will support Java. Uh, we will, I personally work on the um, integration with containers, because right now we are basically having this thing called uh, job object in Windows. And you can think about that thing as a little container. It's a little bit misleading, but it's not really. It doesn't provide you the isolation. But as a next step, we integrate containers, and then we have uh, also the full support. So this is basically where we had it. All right, thank you. Um, so everyone's question, and oftentimes when I talk to end users, uh, I hear that people are building microservices around legacy apps versus actually rewriting the technology. So can you, would you care to make any comments and advice to the audience, maybe what you've seen in terms of can I build microservices on top of a legacy app, or do I really need to rewrite? So Doug will have a, a very opinionated uh, piece on this, but you know, just because you can do something doesn't mean you should, right? It's a it's a case by case basis. I, I do think a, an important factor if you do decide to go and, and you can't quite get away from how you did it. Uh, Boris brought it up, is the fact you, you, know, you need to look at frameworks and, and orchestration capability that provides state to the system. You know, because the whole academic exercise of 12-factor apps and all, is, it's, it's great in theory, but the, the truth of the matter is most applications still need some sort of state, because old habits die hard. You mentioned people in process being a problem. That's why. Uh, and, and so, you know, I, I think that's kind of where we're, we're trying to take things and, and handle it both. You know, can you go to microservices? Of course. I mean, you know, it's just time and effort. But at the end of the day, is it worth that 
effort for each and every system you have, or should you, you know, maybe keep legacy, legacy, and then move the next gen stuff uh, further along into this paradigm? Yeah, I agree. Well, so <laughs> it's tough because I'm a developer, so of course I want to write new stuff, <laughs> and I want to I want to pad my resume. I mean, there, I mean, I'll be truthful for you. I think a lot of people at DreamWorks and a lot of the places I've worked. You get a lot of people out there, and they they want to. They're developers. They want to go learn this stuff. They're going to conferences like like App AppSphere, and they're hearing microservices in half of the conference sessions. And what am I missing out on? <laughs> right? Is is oftentimes what we what we get kind of caught up in. But but in honesty, I think you know we do have a lot of legacy apps, some that we're not going to touch because they don't need to touch. They're internal apps. They're working fine. It'd be really hard to go to management and tell them that we're getting a lot of ROI out of making them into microservices. So I, do, I definitely don't advocate as much as I'd like to, that everything has to be a microservice. However, sort of a game changer for the things that we are changing, legacy apps that we are going through the concerted effort of, of changing into microservices, it's, it's one of a couple reasons. One would be because it's not scalable in its current form. It's because it's, in a, in a, it's, it's structured in a way that makes it really hard to, to build forward because it's got a lot of legacy and a lot of heavyweight decisions were, were in there. A lot of people have left. So sometimes it's more expensive to go into that legacy code base and try to make sense of it than just let's tease it apart and make them more manageable, separate little bits of functionality. That's easier from that point on to maintain. Another big game changer for us is enabling people outside the studio. So inside the studio, got a lot of empowerment for our users. They got these really kick butt workstations, it's awesome, and they've got connectivity, which is fantastic. They, they've got the world of stuff right there inside, but the, but the reality is a lot of really talented artists out there don't live in Glendale, California, and so we have to have some way that we can extend our reach to enable those other artists to contribute to our movies, and a way to do that is through the cloud, is, is through, through accessing our services through protocols like HTTP, and the truth is a lot of our legacy apps, they're not available in that way. So microservices, it tends to get overloaded because you, you, yeah, and, and in actuality, that's how we started this conversation. It's, it's this little piece of functionality that's exposed in a way that makes it language you know, neutral and all that kind of stuff. But the reality is what comes with that a lot of times is a lot of community support. These guys up here can definitely attest to cloud deployment and security that comes with that. And there's a lot of value add you get by making a microservice because I think the community as a whole is, is rallying around it. And as a developer, I sort of take advantage of that because I can't do it all. We got a small little team. We can do our core competency, which is write our little bit of code. I have to hope these guys are doing the rest for me because I don't have a dedicated team for security. I don't have a dedicated team for deployment. And I certainly don't have you know global representation for all this stuff. So. I definitely need help in that area. So there's a reward in writing microservices that's beyond just you know, the scalability and that kind of stuff. It's I can leverage technologies outside of my business space. It's actually an interesting balancing act. Um, if, if an IT organization wants to move to microservices because they want to adopt microservices, it's it's a tough road to climb. There needs to be a business initiative associated with it. And the trend that I'm seeing is a number of initiatives that start in the CMO's office or the CSO's office uh, drive certain behavior to force um, traditional IT organizations into moving in that direction. Um, I, I foresee a time very in, in very near future where every organization out there regardless of what industry market segment you're in will eventually become a software company um, because how else are you going to get close to your customers and to really be competitive and stay competitive you need to adopt trends like mobility and uh, internet of things and to do that with monolithic applications, whether they're legacy or not, is a, is, is a tough thing to accomplish. So really, you, in, in some ways, um, competition and, and startups that are cropping up all over the place will be a forcing function for organizations to really adopt a microservice style of architecture, regardless of if your data lives in a 
a relational legacy or relational database or a NoSQL database, I think it's going to be a forcing function down the road that every organization will have to think about to remain competitive. Yeah, so Microsoft, we, as, as you know, we have a lot of traditional enterprise customers, and uh, those guys have built out those monolith applications, and if it's like scalable applications, uh, they usually have like three tiers. And because we announced those microservices thing, and it's, it's really a movement in the IT industry, um, we get a lot of questions on, on the Azure side, hey, should we move our applications to microservices? Should we build on top of microservices? Uh, should we build microservices on top of our monolith application? And uh, sounds like a consulting answer, but first of all, it, it really depends on your scenario, right? I've, we had customers, um, their monolith has gotten so complex, every time someone checked in code, it, it broke, it just didn't work. It took them like two days to figure out what went wrong, which component was causing the issue, and so on and so forth. So that's probably a point where you wanna look at re-architecting your application. Another thing is, I would probably, or what I'm, what I'm telling our customers, never think about break off your entire monolith, right? Maybe you need to implement new features to your monolith applications. Implement those new features as microservice, as a microservice first, right? So do this like a gradual approach rather than like the big bang approach. Um, because also your efforts with microservices is gonna shift um, like to a very, you need a very mature DevOps pipeline for microservices. And if you do all those things at once, like breaking off your monolith, making everything microservices, changing your entire processes, your entire flows, which by the way is really hard in enterprise organizations to um, bring in those new processes, it's, it's probably not set up for success. So I would say to answer your question, um, should uh, microservices be built on top of um, um, legacy applications monolith. Um, I, I would think about it like new features implemented as microservices because that's certainly the trend and it gives you a lot of advantages. Or analyze your monolith applications in ways where you can break apart certain functionality. Uh, we've seen that with customers doing very successfully. They had a bunch of services and then they broke some services out and made them microservices. Okay. Thanks. So if you're holding all these teams accountable where they're managing the entire life cycle of these individual services, but they need to work together to deliver the application functionality, the user experience that, that the users are expecting, how important or how do you believe monitoring needs to change to be able to provide that visibility both to hold the teams accountable and to make sure that you're delivering a high quality product to your end user, whether they be internal or external. So, I, again, with the responsibility, as, as a traditional developer, years and years ago, all I had to worry about was just my code. And I handed it off and it was somebody else's problem. There's a, there's a great poster our ops guy has. I know Tim knows. It's, it's, the, it's this little girl standing in front of this just it, this blaze, and it goes, you know, not my problem, DevOps's problem. <laughs> it's just this ideal that, you know, I don't have to worry about it. But now with the microservices sort of trend, I'm suddenly now responsible at 2 in the morning for when the database goes down. So I have to be a little more responsible, I suppose. So, <laughs> so yes, uh, APM tooling, any kind of monitoring now becomes critical for me as a developer where it wasn't as much before. Because there's a lot of disparate parts with microservices. Let's say I want to use Mongo, and let's say I have lots of microservices, and I want to orchestrate a bunch to do some kind of neat bit of functionality. You know, it's great. I can do them in different languages with different backend databases. But the reality is that's a lot of stuff for me to now have to triage when something goes bad. So it becomes critical now that I have some sort of central tool that I can refer to to kind of follow along what happened when that user hit that button and something imploded. So. Um, and it's not just sort of surface level. Like, I, I can't go to a log anymore and just kind of follow it through. I need to have something that patches together all these disparate technologies, introspects them, so I can look deep into the database and do explains on queries without having to go into each and every little component outside of this sort of convenient space. So, so I definitely say now more than ever, uh, I'm interested, and I think people definitely need to be interested in having tooling that can provide support around this sort of microservices effort. 
the trick has always been correlating everything, re regardless of if it was microservices or not. I, I, I think the challenge now is, to your point, the, the developer has to be responsible for it, right? So you, you need to ensure that at the time of deployment, it's already monitored and it's just there. Um, and, and, you know, how you make these things aware in an application, is, honestly, it's more of a challenge in a microservices world. Um, you know, it's one reason that, you know, again, we're working closely with you guys to make sure you understand, like, the concept of labels in Kubernetes and so you can understand and, and get insight to how the application is deployed in the environment. Um, be, because, again, you do have all these disparate logs. You do have all these different databases all over the place now. Uh, and, and so understanding and grouping it together as the concept of an app versus 50 separate services, I mean, that in and of itself is a challenge. Um, and, and so I, I think it's, it's true DevOps when you, you think of the need for monitoring is that before the developer didn't care. They threw it over, operations put the monitoring in, and life was good, but now you're having to start that process earlier. I'll, I'll answer the question from a container standpoint. I often get asked, you know, how do, how do we do security? How do we do replication? How do we do uh, isolation? Um, how, how would you do that with containers? And whenever I get these kinds of questions, I always ask back, how do you do things today? And what you'll find is, from a process perspective, especially on the container side, um, you should be able to leverage things in terms of how you do it today with the container world. Um, the, the big difference is the, the, the whole concept around microservice and containers really take the, um, the, the process, the, the people, tools, and process to the next level where you can have developers that are focusing on code. You can have cluster managers that are ensuring that your application is running per desired state. You can have site reliability engineers that are focusing on ensuring that your uh, application is running and any alarms go off, you know, there's, there's a remedy uh, in place. So it, it, in, in some ways, it, it takes away from the responsibilities that are associated in terms of taking a developer and turning them into more of a, a, a DevOps role. Um, and that's really what containers and uh, cluster management really bring to the table. Yeah, so um, to add to those responsibilities, I, I, I think you guys are aware, like when, when Satya took charge of Microsoft, the first change he's, he did was actually he got rid of our testers, right? We don't have testers anymore because we wanted to be more agile. And um, to be honest, some of our products, especially services, like right after that like reorganization took place, um, developers were all of a sudden in, in the spotlight, right? Because there was no safety net anymore. Um, yeah, there were some hiccups, and um, with services, they're easily solved like the next day. But I think that also put the developer more into the spotlight. It makes them more responsible. And now, like two years after, I would say, like especially for our internal services that we build a microservices-based approach, uh, developers are more responsible because they've gotten more responsibility. Um, one thing to add is like what's been mentioned before: uh, monitoring and diagnostics is is crucial. I mean, you cannot do that without decent monitoring and diagnostics. And it's it's commonly um, like, yeah, it's, it's like security and diagnostics. It usually gets an afterthought, right? It's like, oh, I'm a developer. I don't want to deal with security stuff. I don't care how that thing authenticates, right? And I don't want to write any trace statements or logging statements and stuff like that. So, but this is, this is literally in a microservices world or in a service, distributed services world, that's key. And just by doing, introducing like proper monitoring, um, diagnostic solutions, you also give the developers the tools to be more responsible. Yeah, makes sense, definitely, thanks. Um, so the one thing that I always struggled with in microservices is data coupling. So when you look at a lot of the designs and how people are doing this, they're pairing the database with the microservice that accesses the data. There's obviously issues in managing that at scale and ensuring consistency. So. Uh, do any of you have comments or best practices around how to deal with that or how you think about that, uh, you know, <laughs> the, uh, the fact that the data is coupled with the service and deployed with the service? 
So, have we solved this problem? Not entirely, but we, we have been making strides to do so. So, it is true, while I, I talked about before some of our legacy apps where they suffered, was that a lot of people got creative with joins. As these apps grew, the join statements became incredibly big, and they took a toll on read operations. So, uh, and write operations. I mean, we'd have completely co independent things of that query uh, suffering because of that one query that was thrown in the system and it jammed up everything. So having everything all in one place doesn't necessarily always work and it certainly didn't work for us. So I try to embrace more the idea that we're going to tease apart all of our disparate, you know, or, or basically spread our data out and, and be okay with that. It was a little unnerving because I have a whole legacy of getting really good with joint statements and now having it all separate where I can't join the tables together it was a little terrifying in the beginning but I did see a demo from eBay and PayPal and a couple other companies that had shown the power of secondary indexes basically looking at things like Elasticsearch and these in these alternative data stores that are really good about answering really complicated questions what it required from us the development staff was to basically make sure we were placing a copy of that data redundantly into an elastic search engine and then redirecting the queries to the the places where it made most sense to answer that and that's super empowering i mean we you don't necessarily need to to put your reads and writes into the same place you actually are empowered now to perform queries where those types of queries make sense and we're not we're not sort of limited anymore now that's not easy i i, I throw it out there like now everything's awesome but it, i mean it there's still the complexity of a of a multi geography you know, situation where I've got to get this data everywhere and I, 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 you know, I have to try to get it as coherent and consistent as possible and, and consistency is almost out the door. You have to accept. You have to go through this sort of religious moment of accepting eventual consistency. And, and it's a, it is a microservices ETH kind of thing because it's, when you're writing this app, you have to keep in mind right from the beginning, whatever backend I'm choosing, I'm owning the responsibility of distributing this data, making it available in multi-geographies, and, and sensibly maybe, maybe making another copy of this data into some other backend data store. It's not as trivial as I just add some table to some legacy table schema and I'm done. It's, you're inheriting a lot more responsibilities. And we were talking about that in the back too, which is, which is an interesting thing is there's so much technology out there. One of the things that scares me a little, all right, a lot, <laughs> is, there's, I don't know, how many NoSQL solutions out there now? There's how many frameworks given in how many different languages? There's now this containers concept, and with the containers comes security concepts, which comes with, uh, you know, all these other kinds of fancy things that come, you know, it's, as a developer who now has to own all this, I now have to know a lot more than I used to, and it keeps changing every year, <laughs> so... You know, I go online, I, I, I look at conference talks, and there's really cool stuff I get excited about, and I'm like, oh my God, that's something else I'm gonna have to learn now. So it's, it's, it's a lot. It's, it's exciting, but it's a lot. But I will, I will come back to the fact that, okay, so having consolidated databases, uh, being responsible for these secondary indexes, it is a lot more work. You have to put a lot more effort in, but the reward is there. I mean, I can't tell you how exciting it is to know that I can redirect any sort of query into the appropriate back end and get a pretty immediate response that doesn't necessarily impact our other productions or our other use cases that we've got for our other services. So it's good and bad. Sure. Any uh, other panelists have? Uh... Yeah, well, I, w I would like to add to that. If, uh, if you look at containerized microservices, because uh, containers are not necessarily required for microservices. Right, but like the trend, certainly everything, like when we talk about microservices today, it's like containerized microservices. Um, there is like that, that notion of, do I have my data deserialized, uh, decentralized, uh, what you basically mentioned, and uh, I do agree that's like the, a very good approach. The only word of caution I have, if you have a lot of microservices in your system, and they call into each other because, for example, you have a shopping solution and your transaction service needs to, transaction went through, so it needs to be transactional safe. And then it needs to basically call back in your, let's say, product catalog service and do a decount of uh, the, the, um, the item available, right? Then your, your entire infrastructure, like you need to think about transactional safety and you also need to think about that your entire system becomes a little bit more chatty. And, that's probably what I, what probably, but that's what I wanted to add to that. Yeah. Well, 
I'll, I'll just add with, uh, with containers in particular, with Kubernetes, we introduced this uh, primitive called a pod, which is uh, a group of containers that have similarities. Um, so for example, just take the, exa the example that you just mentioned, uh, shopping cart and uh, order container could live within the same pod. And this pod could have volumes that are mounted to it. So they could access the same data. And then from a, a resiliency perspective, you can define your pods within clusters that are federated in nature. And uh, the idea is to provide a policy-driven methodology where you can specify um, uh, rules in terms of how you want your data replicated across clusters and, and so on. All right. Well, uh, we, Chris is also actually presenting on a lot of these concepts tomorrow. He has a session, so you can definitely go to that uh, to learn a bit more about these new architectures and, and obviously how Red Hat, uh, you know, solves some of these problems. Um, but I wanted to thank all the panelists uh, for, for joining us today. And um, yeah, thank you very much. And Joe has a couple of housekeeping items. So I'll invite uh, Joe up on stage and thank you very much to the panelists.